A lack of vitamins can produce tissue starvation characterized by roughened skin. It can take place anywhere, but most often found on thighs and arms, it may advance to a stage that looks like mosaic pavement, parched and crinkled because of vitamin starvation. To help prevent this tissue starvation, take all the known needed vitamins. Introducing One A Day, it brings you A, B1, B2, C, and D, plus niacin, calcium, pentothenate, or pentothenate if you're me, and B6 in a single capsule. The year was 1946 and dietary supplements as we know them were fresh on the scene and multivitamins were the most purchased type of dietary supplement and remain so to this day. Actually in 2020, us Americans of the US spent about 8 billion on multivitamins alone. And I know exactly why. I was reading that 1946 ad and started checking my arms and thighs to see if I had that and I never even heard of tissue starvation. One day almost sold me on an 80 year old advertisement. That my friends is the power of marketing. Which when we think about why we buy so many supplements, I mean, you tell me, what do you think it is? In 2020, we spent $55 billion on dietary supplements. That's a ways away from when the US was spending only 4 billion on dietary supplements in the ancient olden days of 1994. Okay, so what produced such a rise in consumption? Was it COVID? Researchers compiled studies that quantified supplement use around the pandemic. Could you guess the most used supplement in attempts to prevent COVID-19? Out of 45,000 US participants in one of the included studies, 70% were supplement users and the most popular dietary supplement, the multivitamin came in second behind vitamin D. Medical reps were promoting certain vitamins, particularly vitamin D because of its immunomodulatory, anti-inflammatory, antioxidative, and antiviral properties. Sounds fancy. Did it work? We'll get to that and more, but first, it actually was not the pandemic that increased dietary supplement use. Before the pandemic in 2018, dietary supplements were valued at 46 billion, still mountains of more pills and potions than what we used to consume in the 1990s. What calls for so many supplements? I mean, how different are humans in today's time than we were 30 years ago in 1994? Biologically speaking, not very different at all. Okay, I can hear you, Johnny, go way back further. I was about to, but the 1940s is when dietary supplements as we know them came to be. They're kind of new. Ponder this, what problem are we solving and can we quantify if we're actually getting healthier? Now, this entire video is not gonna be me just taking a sledgehammer to dietary supplements. By the end of this, we will know what role dietary supplements should actually play in our lives and some of the data that never gets discussed. We've practically abolished vitamin deficient conditions like scurvy, beriberi, right? Uh, our food is more accessible than ever before and Yet our cabinets are filled with more random soups than ever before in human history. I don't know why I feel the need to condense dietary supplements to the word soups. Y'all watch out for me. Did our soil become less nutritious? Is our breast milk weaker? Why dietary supplements? Ooh. Her name is Sheila and she's real. Unlike this one. If you guys ever start to notice that she's wilting, that's because I am too. Welcome to No Lab Core Required. My name is Johnny Cole Dixon. We talk about this concept often here, this idea that we have to be increasingly more proactive in our journey in order to be a healthy people. Go back some time and being alive was virtually synonymous with health. Now, that sounds oversimplified and a little crazy, I, I know, but Obviously, outside of communicable disease and strenuous situations, you take a person from back then and compare them to us now, and just think about it. We have to fight to get sunlight. We have to fight to touch grass. We have to fight to get good sleep. We have to fight for whole foods. I guess what I'm wondering is, have we strayed so far that we now have to fight for our essential nutrients? Scientists wanted to assess if our food is truly less nutritious than it used to be. So they gathered data on the nutrient density of crops produced in 1950. Asparagus, broccoli, carrots, kale, strawberries, watermelon, and many more for a total of 43 different foods were assessed. They took the data and measured it up against crops produced in 1999 and they found some fascinating stuff. Out of 13 nutrients measured, six of them had decreases. Calcium, potassium, iron, ribose, 
riboflavin or riboflavin if you're me, protein and vitamin C. We'd hope that those numbers were averages, right? The mean, but the authors of the study actually favored reporting the median because these were more reliable numbers. In other words, this was far from a linear measurement. You see, we'd like to think that the differences would just jump out at us, like comparing a new car to an old beater, but when measuring nutrient density from way back when to now, it's just a little bit more complicated. The authors went on writing one of the longest discussions I seen about how much nuance is to be considered from how many crops used to be homegrown, cultivars used, measurement methods, environmental differences, and how random error made it nearly impossible to look at the difference of an individual food. Say a spinach leaf then versus a spinach leaf now. Who knows? And this is just the difference between the 50s and the 90s. I don't know, if you take a farmer from way back then and put him in a grand car today in 2024, I don't know if that brother would know how to drive it. So, is our food actually less nutritious? And if so, does that warrant the use of dietary supplements? Well, that question is best answered by looking at this review study. Calcium, potassium, iron, magnesium, vitamin C, zinc, you name it. Virtually every nutrient has been found to be present in higher concentrations in organically produced foods versus conventional. So we may not be able to fully elucidate the differences between a food's nutrient density today compared to way back when, but we've done plenty of research on, say, an organically produced Brussels sprout versus its conventional counterpart. Organic spinach has 77% more iron, organic apples and pears retain up to 125% more vitamin C, and analysis of over 340 studies found there was an across the board increase in basically every relevant phytonutrient when comparing organic to conventional. Okay, Johnny, what's the difference between organic and conventional? It all comes down to how the soil is treated. The study credits the 1940s for when we started to push yield and sacrifice of quality by using agrochemicals, pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, the stuff depleting the soil of its nutritive power, but ultimately used by the industry in favor of more and bigger crops. I've seen soil depletion, soil erosion, soil degradation, call it what you will, but the impact is simple. Beat the brakes off the soil, food becomes less nutritious, we, the consumer, get less nutrients. So we'll take a person that's considerably great at diet, and you know the person, it may even be you, not eating much of any processed foods, but more importantly, they eat their whole foods, but they don't take supplements. And I guess what we're asking is, can that person get everything they need from only eating food? Last time, last time, last time I checked the inventory of the shop, these were highlighted in red, and I was like, oh, we don't have many of these left, do we? You can be one of the special people to own the original, legendary, iconic Do More Listening purple label hat. Check description below and get the Do More Listening hat. If you miss out on the hat, grab yourself a hoodie. We don't skip on quality. Everyone is telling me they love this thing. It's soft, it's snug, it's stylish, and it should be shipping straight to your step. It will become your favorite hoodie. Watch, and if it doesn't, I will personally come to your home and tailor it until it is your favorite hoodie. Jump into the shop link below there are other items as well. Get yourself or whoever you think of first, something. Join the club. There are three types of dietary supplements, micronutrients, macronutrients, and the woo woo stuff. Micro, these are the things that have dietary reference intakes. You may have heard of RDAs, recommended dietary allowances, right? Your body needs this much of this item, this much of this item, so on and so on. These are our vitamins and minerals, things like magnesium, folate, that kind of stuff. Macronutrient supplements are the things that fall under the macro umbrella of protein, fat, or carbs. L glutamine is a protein, a collagen is protein, a BCAAs, protein, protein powders, right? All of these things at the end of the day can be replicated by eating a piece of chicken, right? A protein food. Okay, fat, fish oil, cod liver oil, omega-3 tabs. The effects of these things can be replicated by eating a piece of fish. Okay, carbs, uh, wheat dextrin, uh, psyllium husk, or psyllium husk if you're me. The effects of these things can be replicated by eating a bowl of lentils. Woo woo stuff, right? This is your green juice powder, your lion's mane mushroom, your uh, passion flower, and even some of the more household items too, like ginger or turmeric. These things with unspecified beneficial properties. Now, unless sold by a literal snakes oil salesman, all of these things provide what is advertised. Yes, even the woo-woo stuff. Now, whether you feel it, the effects, is it placebo, that kind of thing, that's a whole nother conversation. But I bring this up 
because this video mainly revolves around the more essential things like vitamins. But also I did make an entire separate video on some woo woo stuff, green juice. If you are interested, you can check the description and watch it after this one. So can just eating food give us everything that we need? Yes, absolutely. Even our more conventionally grown foods are packed with enough vitamins and minerals to supply our demand. There's no debate there. And even yet, we still don't feel a nudge to not take supplements. And let me be clear again and say, I'm not arguing that these supplements are not necessary. I just want to expand the conversation on why you think that they are. You see, we all intuitively know that supplements ain't coming close to the advantageous power of real whole foods. But we hear about the benefits of omega-3 and we go, ah, oh, fish oil. <laughs> rather than the fish itself. Actually, here's a fascinating study that took dietitians living in Turkey to see what they supplemented with during COVID. And out of 550 dietitians, 95% used supplements to combat COVID and 82% of them were taking fish oil. Remember vitamin D was the most used supplement to fight COVID? Yeah, these dietitians were stacking up by not only getting the high concentration of vitamin D that's already in fish oil, but everything else that comes in fish oil. You see, I believe this is human nature. We've advanced to such a point of convenient nutrition and we've afforded ourselves the luxury to just stack up nutrients as we please, right? And this is okay behavior. In fact, I'd argue this is healthy behavior. Now, it does come with one major pitfall we'll talk about here in a bit, but don't take my word for it. Could you guess the number one reason reported for why we consume dietary supplements? A, overall health and wellness, B, fill nutritional gaps, C, manage individual conditions, or D, fight off chronic disease? A, overall health and wellness. Just specific enough to know what we're talking about, but broad enough to not mean anything at all. What supplements do you take every day and why? And also, is one of them vitamin D? There's a chance you do, as vitamin D is the most purchased and consumed individual dietary supplement in all of the US, likely the entire world. Makes sense, I mean, we spend a lot of time in shaded rooms, our cars have roofs, right? And the sun's rays aren't getting to us. And the sun's rays, it's what's used by the body to synthesize vitamin D. I should invest in a pointer. So what does the research say about vitamin D intake? Is it doing anything? I think you're gonna find this very interesting. Now, there are tiers of quality when it comes to research. In other words, the conclusions drawn from this study represents this much weight, but the conclusions drawn from this study represents this much weight. Let's start with observational studies. A lot of them have been done on vitamin D. And significant associations were found between vitamin D deficiency and very bad outcomes. Cardiovascular disease, cancers, straight up death. Researchers were all like, oh, now, observational research is preliminary, and that's because we are just taking a population and we're just looking at them and then drawing some conclusions. After we get our association, though, we go ahead and graduate to some heftier research and we do what we call an interventional study where we take the same people, possibly same similar population or however you have it, and intervene in their lives and draw some more weighty results. What has been coined the gold standard of scientific research are what we call RCTs or randomized controlled trials. These are interventional studies with a whole lot of weight. So we did a whole bunch of these RCTs, giving folks some vitamin D and looking at what happens. And we found some interesting stuff. In these RCTs, there were no significant effects on the primary outcomes, including cancer, cardiovascular events, and mortality. Interesting. So there's observational studies communicating one thing over here and interventional studies communicating something else over here. What's going on? Well, it turns out a lot of those RCTs didn't start off with people that were already deficient in vitamin D. That's like if you and I received word that there were a bunch of cars shutting down on the freeway. So we go run to the window, we go check it out and we look out onto the freeway, but we only focus on the new and fancy cars and we just kind of disregard the old raggedy ones. We wouldn't find much of anything shutting down unless they were Teslas. Oh, Tesla joke on the internet, oh, cool points. Now, despite the mixed findings, this same review goes on to point out that when you look at all the studies together, you find a little bit of good stuff like reductions in cancer mortality and respiratory infections. So what about vitamin D and COVID? Well, I did a little digging and there was a common stone, if you will. Represented well by this review that analyzed 34 different studies and found there was no association between low vitamin D levels and risk of mortality, ICU admission, ventilation, risk of disease severity, length of hospital stay, or testing positive 
for COVID. But what kept popping up in these studies was that vitamin D levels were coming in a lot lower for those that tested positive for COVID compared to those that didn't. In other words, you had COVID, you had low vitamin D. You didn't have COVID, you had high vitamin D. Now, here's the question. Were sufficient levels of vitamin D protective against contracting the infection or reverse causality? Did contracting the infection have some type of vitamin D lowering impact? Both those questions beyond the scope of this video, but I think this builds a decent case for vitamin D supplementation either way. One more note from the first study I brought up, the authors found even with high dosage of vitamin D in these RCTs, there weren't really any safety issues. Remember this, we're gonna talk more in a bit, but we're starting to hone in on what's important here. Your next supplement purchase will be a waste of money if you fall in this major pitfall. What is it? I'll let the science tell you. A bunch of RCTs have been done on multivitamin supplements overall, evaluating similar things as mentioned before. Researchers find women taking them and women not taking them have the same risk for breast cancer. Multivitamin intake generally doesn't alter the risk of any vascular issues, CBD, heart attack, stroke, that kind of stuff. And there's no big unveiled truth that multivitamin vitamins aren't doing much of anything on paper. Even the NIH's quick fact sheet, fat sheet? Fact sheet for fat sheet. That's what's on, what's, on, what's on a fat sheet. What's on there? But even this fact sheet for health professionals explains this. In observation studies, some find potential health benefits from multivitamins. Some even find harm. Others have found nothing. And same goes for RCTs. But here's the problem with all of this science. Because people with healthier diets and lifestyles are more likely to use dietary supplements, attributing health benefits to the use of supplements instead of healthy behavior is difficult. Okay, consider a guy. Let's call him Lance. <laughs> Typical standard American diet eater, right? Seed oils, whole lot of processed foods, whole lot of convenient stuff, a lot of carbs and sugar, not a lot of, uh, not a lot of vegetables, but he takes his supplements. What the research is suggesting is this guy is on his way to the graveyard, but at least his body will have all of the micronutrients it needed. We can't out supplement our bad habits, right? The soups don't make us healthy, uh, specifically the micronutrient ones. They just supply us. In other words, it is really only when we are deficient in these nutrients that our body runs into very bad specific conditions. But once the body has adequate supply, there is no added benefit to having more and more. It's like if I was moving into a studio apartment, not a lot of furniture being moved, but I order five moving trucks. That's not gonna help me get into that apartment any faster, but now I just gotta deal with four unused moving trucks. And the body does the same thing. It comes in and it goes around to see what needs it. It may be stored, it may be excreted, but either way, adds no benefit. But Johnny, even still, I don't see a reason to not take dietary supplements. And honestly, me neither. <laughs> Having this conversation and making this video makes me want some right now. I'm probably gonna order some. I mean, it's a really cool idea. Nutritional insurance, as Rosenberg would call it. 58% of Americans were taking supplements in 2018. This number is now likely well into the 60% post-pandemic. Rosenberg is just a researcher from a random paper I was reading. Just said his name like that because it sounds prestigious. Rosenberg. Johnny Rosenberg. All right, the science is not quite done explaining why your next soup purchase is going to be a waste of money. And this is actually my favorite part of the video. Get a load of this study. Researchers were interested in the anti-inflammatory and antioxidative power of vitamin C, which, quick aside, nothing can mobilize and fortify your immune system quite like vitamin C can. It's like a Super Mario power-up for your body. It's incredible stuff. But what these researchers found was fascinating. They split 20 men up into two groups, one group given 1050 milligrams of vitamin C in typical form of isolated vitamin C in a tablet. Group two received camu camu fruit juice, which is high in vitamin C at a dosage supplying also 1050 milligrams of vitamin C. In the camu camu group, biomarkers of oxidative stress and inflammation were both significantly reduced. In the vitamin C tablet group, nothing happened. Now, this is crazy, and I can see you adding the camu camu juice to your cart right now, but the scientists go on to help us understand. Camu camu possibly contains other known and unknown antioxidant substances, and or camu camu may have substances that increase bioavailability or our ability to actually use the nutrient. And I'm here to help us understand that this is the case with all of our foods. When we take a whole food and we weigh it up against an isolated nutrient, it's gonna be a knockout fight every time. And this is what I meant by, we intuitively know that supplements ain't coming close to the advantageous power of whole foods. Sure, on paper the molecules are the same, but food presents a unique situation where the nutritive complexity is actually what grants us its greatest effect. 